Well, good day, everybody. My name is Tete Badloi. I'm the communications officer at Sapost. I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar as we look forward to an interesting topic of discussion, edible insects in South Africa. I'm going to quickly give you the house rules and hand over to Lisa so that she can introduce the speakers. Uh, as part of the house rules, guys, please know that all opinions and statements are those of the individuals making the presentations and not, not necessarily the opinion or view of Safost. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Safost website within the coming seven days. For the best viewing of today's presentation material, please click on Maximize in the upper right corner of the slideshow, then Restore to return to the normal view. Please turn off other applications that require internet connection to avoid slow transmission and blurry vision. Audio is transmitted over the computer, so please have your speakers or headphones on and volume turned up in order to hear. A telephone connection is not available. Questions should be submitted to the presenter during the presentation using the questions section at the right side of the screen. Click on the drop down arrow, type your question and then submit. All questions will be answered at the end of each presentation. Please note that when you're typing your question, refrain from using acronyms to allow the moderator to easily read your questions out. With that being said, I would like to hand over to Lisa to introduce today's speakers. Lisa, over to you. Super, thanks, Tetsi. And then welcome to today's uh, webinar. Um, so I'm Lisa Ronquist Ross, I'm chair of the Cape branch for Safost. Uh, we have two excellent speakers today, um, and I'm going to, to, to introduce our first speaker to talk on this fascinating topic of ed edible insects. So our first speaker is Leah Besser. Uh, Leah is a PhD candidate at Stellenbosch University Food Science. Um, she's co-founder and head of R&D for a very innovative agri-tech startup called Gourmet Grub. Um, and she's going to be talking to, 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 to us today about um, consumer perceptions of eating insects um, in the Western world and sharing some insights from research that she did um, with the insect experience at pop-up restaurant in Cape Town. So over to you, Leah. We look forward to this very interesting talk. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Lisa. That was a great introduction. Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about edible insects and the consumer perceptions. Um, so, ooh, hold on. Okay, there we go. So if we look just briefly at the background, um, as we all know, uh, consumers are starting to look for alternatives to their current traditional protein sources. Um, because they're becoming more aware of the sustainability impact and the environmental impact of our current traditional farming. Um, so this brings to light a lot of interesting alternatives. Um, and, you know, along with that, the population is growing at such a rapid rate. Um, I don't know if this is in the way. Hold on. Sorry. Um, the, the population is growing at such a rapid rate, and this has... Uh, cause an increase in demand for food with one of the biggest demands for, for protein-based products. So this has led to insects being quite an interesting alternative, um, but what's interesting is that it's actually an age-old food source. So it's just very new in the Western context, which brings about a lot of exciting um, opportunities. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the background because Vusi is going to focus on that, so I'm just going to dive straight into consumer perception. Um, and this is actually one of the biggest barriers preventing the commercialization of edible insects, specifically in the Western world. Um, and cultural exposure has been shown to have quite a big impact on acceptance. So if we look at some of the Eastern countries, um, consumers are very used to eating insects. But what's interesting is they prefer eating insects in their whole form. So when presented with insects in a disguised manner, they are less um, willing to eat it. Um, which is completely different to, to Western consumers, which are more, more willing to eat insects in a disguised form. Um, so I think it's very important to look at the context of where you're introducing insects and sort of what um, cultures you, you're introducing them to. So today I'm going to focus just on the Western consumers um, because that's something that affects our, our food system a lot. Um, so Western consumers are less um, apprehensive about eating disguised insects, which when you look at how we eat, it, it does make sense. I mean, we don't usually eat um, meat straight off the bone. We go to our shops, we buy it in a perfectly cut form. 
I'm sure most people don't even know um, what a carcass looks like. So, you know, Western consumers are quite used to eating their food quite far removed from where it comes from. Um, on top of that, consumers are more willing to eat insects in foods that they're familiar with. So we're seeing insects coming onto the market in products um, such as burger patties, um, in a flower, um, in a pasta, um, in protein bars. So this really in, um, introduces some exciting opportunities to try and bring insects into the market in a way that people um, are familiar with. And I think this is also very important to try and understand because um, if we start bringing it in in a different way, you're going to have an immediate aversion barrier. So as you can see, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it just shows the complexities of factors that affect consumer acceptance at the moment. And, you know, I wish we, we had all the answers at the moment, but, you know, it's so different depending on which country you come from, um, what kind of consumers you're looking at. And also a, a very important factor is the, the product related circumstances as well. So just to focus on the key factors that affect uh, consumer acceptance, um, education has shown to increase acceptance. Um, and this also includes when you um, attach information to your product. So when you have an insect-based product and you promote the sustainability impact or the health impact, it does have an effect on the consumer accepting the product. Um, but time and time again, flavor and texture has been seen to be the biggest predictor of acceptance. So it doesn't matter how much you tell people it's good for you or it's going to save the world, you can't get around the fact that it needs to taste um, good. Um, and along with that is uh, taste exposure. So it's all fair and well to make a great tasting product, but we really need to try and create more circumstances for consumers to try insects because a lot of people have this aversion barrier, but they haven't really tasted insects. So it's, it's sort of this preconceived idea without really understanding why they don't like the idea behind it. So taste exposure has been shown to increase awareness and acceptance for Western consumers. And I think this is something that needs to be um, done a lot more. Um, and what goes hand in hand with that is the accessibility to edible insects. So it's important for people to be able to access it. Otherwise, it just remains this foreign, novel, unknown food source that just sort of increases the barrier once again. An important element in the future is going to be the marketing of insects. And you'll see now there's a lot of different ways that people are trying to do it. Um, you get people trying to sell whole insects sort of as a novelty snack. Um, you get people trying to disguise it as a meat alternative. Um, and you get people trying to make it a, a protein powder, so it's sort of a comparison to, to whey protein. Um, and then uh, at Gourmet Grub, we've, we've developed a, a dairy alternative from it. So I think the marketing element of it is still very much in its infancy. And it's quite interesting to see the different approaches that people are trying to take. And, and we're still going to see which one works best because it's still very much new. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we've done here in South Africa. So Gourmet Grub partnered with Absolute Organics and Marn, and we did this really cool collaboration where we did a six-month pop-up restaurant in Woodstock. And it was South Africa's first insect restaurant. And we basically wanted to try and gain consumer feedback and try and understand what consumers liked. Um, but at the same time, we really wanted to see if we could try and change those perceptions. So we had a chef and we did gourmet styled um, tasting menu so that consumers could try and taste it and see how they taste it and see, you know, we wanted to try and see if their perception before and after was different. Um, we had quite a diverse set of uh, ages as well, uh, typically more between 30 and 39 years old, but I mean, there was a, a whole bunch of different kinds of people that came um, and Interestingly enough, we thought we were going to have a lot more sort of niche diets coming, you know, more your, your flexitarians or your vegetarians. But um, majority of people came were just interested and, you know, didn't have any dietary restrictions, didn't have a specific restriction in their diet. So that was very interesting for us um, and also unexpected. So I think people are very open to the concept. And I, I think it's important to have these sort of platforms for consumers to come in and, and try. So these are the kind of dishes that we had. Um, some of them were visual. Uh, we had polenta fries with mopani powder in it. Uh, we had a pasta with black salted fly flour in the pasta. Um, and then we had croquettes with whole insects um, inside it. So we had a couple of different options for people to try. Um, and 
we asked people to rate the the tasting of the dishes as well as the the preconceived ideas versus um what how they felt after eating it and overall the dishes received a four out of five so you know most people love the dishes there were still some people that just couldn't quite get over the concept which is which is understandable but we received a much uh, we received better feedback than we expected um and then the very exciting part was the, the perception before and after so we had a variety of perceptions before um you know that a lot of people were indifferent they sort of knew about insects but they didn't really have a, a negative or a positive idea about it um a lot of people had quite a negative association with insects thinking that it would be really gross or or yeah basically gross um some people didn't really know they just wanted to come and try and then some people already had quite a good perception of eating insects um you know they thought it was healthy they thought it was good for you they had heard it was sustainable uh, but they hadn't tried it before so we had quite a diversity of opinions um before but what was really amazing was the after um so 80 87 percent of people said that their perception had changed for the better which is which is amazing feedback and although 13 percent looks bad just to put it into context those people's perception who hadn't changed were the people that had a good perception before. So I think overall, the feedback was really, really incredible. And we hadn't expected you know, such a big change, but it did sort of, sort of demonstrate to us that you know, giving people the opportunity to eat insects in a gourmet way can change their perception because you know, they have this idea that it's going to be disgusting and it's all about how you cook it, how you present it, and just that that taste exposure, which which I mentioned before. Um, what was also interesting is we also wanted to try and understand um, consumer preference. Um, and we did find, um, much like the previous studies, that the consumers preferred uh, disguised insects. Um, there were some that liked visible insects, but um, you know, you're going to get those people that prefer the novelty factor. So I think this is important when trying to develop products for the market, especially for the South African market, um, is to really focus on, on disguising the insects. Um, we also looked at the different applications. Um, so majority of the people, so 54% liked, you know, insects in different applications. It wasn't specific. But aside from that, 24% uh, preferred them powdered. So that would be sort of powdered and then used in a, in a pasta or in a protein bar, or you know they can use it in baking. 13% um, like the idea of it as a meat alternative, which is quite different to sort of some of the other Western countries where they see it um, mainly as a meat alternative. So it's quite interesting to sort of try and understand um, how what people think is appropriate for insects and, and for the market. Um, we also did a very interesting um, showcase. So we actually had these insects out on display for people to try. Uh, we didn't think people would try them because we have this perception that people are very squeamish. So we also learned a lot from the experience. And we also had this perception that um, you know mealworms would be the the more favoured choice because that's typically what is used in in, in Western countries now to promote insects. Um, so we didn't tell anyone what these insects were. We just allowed them to taste it and we got uh, their feedback. And what we found, which was really interesting, without any um, sort of cues on what was what or you know what was better for you or what was more local anything like that um the, the insect species that they preferred taste wise and texture wise was the black soldier fly larva which is currently not being used in in western countries as a as a food source because people think that consumers won't like it so that was a very interesting finding for us and it also shows that well it showed us that we can't just assume what consumers are going to like and we can't consumers also can't assume what they're going to like they really need to try and taste and 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 understand what what they like for themselves and you know that feedback is very important for us um so this is just some of the photos um of people eating it so that you can actually believe people came and tried it um and you can see everyone looks very excited it was very busy um we got a lot of positive feedback from it which was very exciting for us because you know we weren't sure how people were going to respond um, you know, South Africa can be very conservative in, in their buying and, and sort of to new concepts. So this, this experience really demonstrated that, you know, people are open, they are curious. Um, and I think 
this reinforces the fact that taste exposure is a really, really important element to introduce insects into the market because you know, people need to try and understand what's available, how it can be used, um, how it can be incorporated in foods. And, and I think through repeat exposure, it's really going to make it more normal for people to eat. And, you know, once it's more available on the market, it's going to be easier for people to access it. And they'll also then know what, what to do with it. Um, yeah, so this was just some of the, the media that we got for the, the restaurant. Um, we got a lot of feedback. People were very excited. Um, yeah, so that was my very short and sweet presentation. And yeah, I hope you guys got a little bit more feedback on on the consumer perception. Super, thank you, Leah. Um, so oh. we, we've got time for questions now before we introduce Vusi. So I see one question here, which might actually be better suited to Vusi, but I'm sure, Leah, you've got some thoughts on it. Um, hi, when talking about insect protein, has comparative work on fat content been done that can be shared? Um, yeah, there's been a lot of fat work done. It also depends on the insect species, but I mean, if you're looking at your, your mealworms and your black soldier fly larva and your crickets, there's a lot of work being done on the fat. Um, what's very interesting about the fat is that the diet of the insect affects the, the fatty acid profile a lot. So uh, there's a lot of variability in, in sort of the farming and then the fat output where the protein is a little bit less variable. So the, the fat element is, I think, is very interesting as, as a future option for, for edible insects, but it's still very much in its, in its infancy compared to, to, to the protein. But I mean, there, there was a research done using a black soldier fly larva fat as a margarine and a butter alternative. Um, in baking. So there's definitely work being done on it and there's a lot of research out on it. It's just, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a little bit more volatile and di more difficult to work with than the, than the proteins. But I think Busi's done some, some work on the fats. Great. Thanks, Leah. I must say, um, I, I had the opportunity to enjoy the insect experience um, and thoroughly did. Took my team along and we ate everything up. Um, we found it all very delicious. Um, we even found ourselves snacking on the mealworms at some point that were <laughs> on the table and quite enjoying their toasted crispiness. Um, so in terms of just, you, you know, in terms of the taste and texture, what is the biggest challenge with working with insects? And then um, just a question for South Africa, if you look at those factors that affect consumer acceptance, you know, education, flavored texture, taste, exposure, accessibility and marketing, which ones do you which ones do you think are the biggest challenge for us as a country in terms of trying to incorporate insects into our diet? So kind of two yeah. two questions there. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the first one, I think the biggest challenge with the the taste and the texture, um, I think it's quite similar to to the plant um, industry where you're trying to mimic um, your meats or your dairies or trying to incorporate in products that that consumers are familiar with. And there's inevitably going to be challenges with with your your taste and your texture, specifically texture because of the functional proteins, they're very different to, to, your, um, to your meats. Um, so that's definitely a challenge going forward. And I think that's, that's sort of indicative of the whole alternative space. Um, but you know, the taste is quite easy to use because it's quite a neutral flavor. Um, and also the feed affects the flavor a lot as well. So I think the biggest challenge is really trying to incorporate it into a product um, where the functionality suits its application. And I think that's where a lot of work is going into now. Um, but that I, th I believe that to be the, the biggest challenge is the texture component more than the, the taste element. Um, in South Africa, I think the biggest thing for us is really um, going to be the taste exposure um, and accessibility because, you know, typically we have Mopani worms, which are very local. Um, but they're very much in the north, but they're, they're not farmed and they're not easily accessible. And we don't really have a lot of people farming uh, edible insects in South Africa because the market is so small. So there isn't really accessibility to, to try it and taste it and for people to buy it and try it at home in, in the comfort of their own home. So I think that's definitely a big thing. And, and in the South African context, although, although I didn't mention this, I do think one of the big things is going to be price because it's still very much a niche market. It's quite expensive. And South Africans are quite particular about, you know, these expensive products that are, you know, alternatives to meat or dairy. So I think that's definitely something that's going to be a challenge going forward. 
um, especially in such a conservative market like South Africa. Thanks, Leah. Um, so we've got a few more. Um, will, prote will the protein from insects be kosher um, or halal certifiable? Um, that really depends on the insect species. So if you look at, um, I'm also not an expert, but I did speak to to the halal board and some and the kosher board, and they said that some insect species are considered um, can be certified. I think locusts and crickets are one of them. Um, but then some of your other ones, like your larva, where they're technically growing in the food, there's a bit of a fine line. Um, so I think it's just going to have to be one of those things that as the industry emerges, people are going to have to apply. Um, but I haven't received a clear cut answer yet um, in terms of that. Thanks, Leah. And then another question around food safety and quality. Um, what is the consumer perception around food safety and quality when consuming insects? Um, there's, there's a variety of opinions. I think some people think that um, we're getting the insects off the road, which freaks people out, um, as opposed to farming them. Um, so there is definitely um, that perception that insects are dirty or they're being harvested in the wild and you don't really know what's in them. Um, and I think education will sort of hopefully try and change that. Um, but I mean, a lot of people, when it's in a food at our restaurant and stuff, we didn't actually get a lot of questions around that, which I was quite surprised about. Um, but I think, yeah, so it depends on, on people's education level and if they know where the insects are coming from. Super, thank you. Thanks, cool. yeah. So that's, um, that's all the questions we have um, for you. Oh, no, cool. there's another one. OK, we just got another one in. Um, would insects cost more than meat at this stage? And do you think over time the price will be reduced? I think you've sort of um, touched on that. Yeah, but the, so it also depends on the insect species. Um, you know, there are some insects that I, I think are going to stay expensive for a really long time. And I think one of the biggest components affecting it is the feed. So if you look at um, crickets and mealworms, they typically grow on clean feed. Um, so your cost impact is quite high and their conversion rate is a bit slower. When you're looking at the black soldier fly larva, um, I mean, they're growing on spent grain at the moment. So they're, they're working on a, on a waste stream essentially. So the cost is much lower and we're harvesting them at 10 days old. So the turnover rate is really, really quick. Um, so at the moment, even in its infancy, we're getting black soldier fly larva um, cheaper than meat per kilo, but at the moment it's more expensive than dairy. So we're hoping to get it cheaper than dairy, but at the moment it's definitely cheaper than meat. Some of the other insect species, I'm skeptical about their uh, potential to become cheaper than meat. Um, but I think automation um, or innovations in terms of the farming automation will definitely help. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Thank you. Um... <laughs> We've got a question around, would I be able to experiment with um, growing black soldier flies at home? Um, yeah, you can. I mean, I think it's probably one of the trickier ones to grow at home because you need nets for the flies. Um, but what's nice is they're not a pest species. So, you know, if you do have some escape artists, they're not going to uh, create any havoc or anything. Um, but you can experiment at home. The setup, there's a lot of uh, research and a lot of, um, you know, articles about how you can set it up but if you want to grow insects at home I'd say mealworms are probably the easiest um, and maybe crickets but yeah you can do black soldier fly larva if you if you don't mind flies escaping every now and again. Um, and we have another question around um, are black soldier flies more suitable for human or animal um, consumption? Uh, I personally think both it just depends on on, on what you farm them so if Typically now for animal feed, in Europe, you have to feed them on clean feed anyway. Here, they're feeding it on, on some agricultural waste, um, such as agri-protein. Uh, but for human consumption, they're perfect. I mean, we're using them for human consumption, both with gourmet grub and I'm researching it for my PhD. So I think they're perfect for, for both applications. And, you know, they have, they have so many benefits over some of the other in, insect species in terms of, you know, high conversion rate, um, the fact that they can recycle organic matter, um, that I think they're perfect for human consumption. Um, they taste really good as well. So yeah, it's just a matter of, of introducing them to the wider market. 
And then a final one, um, are there or has there been work on uh, micro, microorganisms that, organisms that could pose a food safety risk um, should this process be industrialized? I think you you have said that there is already yeah. industrial processes, so maybe you can share a bit more about any microorganisms as a food safety risk. Yeah, they've done a lot of work on, on microorganisms, heavy metals, um, you know, other toxins that come from, from the farming side. So there's been a lot of work being done on it um, for the black soldier fur larva, also mainly on the animal feed side, but I mean, the animal feed um, regulations are very, very strict. So it's a lot of work on that. Um, at the moment with, with my studies, I'm looking at the, the food safety in terms of microbiology, um, heavy metals and allergens with black soldier fur larva. So there is a lot of work going into it. Um, there's a lot of work that's been done on it. Um, but yeah, once again, I think it's very specific to the farm because of the feed and the inputs and the parameters. So I, I don't think it's just a blanket um, a blanket answer. But in terms of the black soldier fly larva, I mean, they've done a lot of work on um, putting bacteria in the feed and seeing if it um, cl cleans it up because essentially they have their own system in their body to, to reduce microorganisms. And it's shown a lot of um, reductions in terms of some of your more pathogenic organisms. So there's, there's a lot of promising elements, um, but I, I do think a lot more needs to go into it before it, you, know, you can fully say from a food safety standpoint that it can go onto the market just, just because it's a new, a new food source. Yeah, thank you, Leah. Absolutely fascinating sure. and great, great set of questions. So we'll cool. move thank over to guys. Vusi now. Thank you. So Vusi, um, Vusi is a lecturer at the Department of Food Science and Technology at CPUT. He has a MSc degree from Wageningen University in the Netherlands um, and an M Tech degree from CPUT. He's currently completing his PhD at CPUT um, and he is a member of the Safos Cape branch, student mentor and a reviewer of several journals. And Vusi will talk to us a bit more about the techno-functional techno properties of edible insect proteins. Um, while we, we obviously would, um, from an environmental and economic point of view, as well as food security, we'd like to incorporate them into our diets. We need to understand this uh, better to be able to actually use them in food formulations. So Vusi, um, we look forward to your, your talk. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Lisa, for that wonderful introduction and um, brilliant uh, presentation by uh, Leah. Um, some of the stuff kind of overlaps what I've already prepared and uh, you're throwing the bar in on me, but it's fine, we'll, we'll do that. <clears throat> um, yeah, as uh, the title has been recited, uh, I just want to say that uh, at CPUT, um, over the past few years, we have been working on uh, black soldier fly larvae uh, for product development, but more recently we started looking at the scientific basis for incorporating um, uh, edible insects, and we also ventured into looking at Mopani worm uh, recently. Uh, we uh, are under the leadership of Prof. Uh, Van Veek as a project leader for the insect uh, project, and uh, as part of my PhD thesis, I also looked at uh, black soldier fly in particular. Um, so the title, the content of my presentation we basically look at the protein challenge and we look at the edible insects in Africa. Uh, we'll talk about the case for edible insects and uh, delve deeper into technofunctional uh, properties and I'll make some uh, concluding remarks. So it is widely accepted that uh, by the year 2050, the world population is expected to reach approximately 9 billion people here on earth and that poses a lot of challenges in terms of um, food production because now we have to produce twice the amount of uh, food that we are currently producing and at the same time the food consumption per capita is expected also to increase more specifically in developing countries um, and this also poses a lot of challenges because um, the amount of available arable land is also shrinking and you also have uh, challenges in terms of sustainability. We see uh, what global warming and climate change is doing to food production systems. But particularly in Africa, uh, uh, we have a problem in terms of food security. It remains a major challenge. And some estimates uh, that um, 
uh, there's around 2 billion people in the planet uh, who are suffering from protein malnutrition. So therefore, there is a case for to be made for edible insect consumptions. So, but now speaking of proteins, what, what do we understand about these proteins? So we can group proteins into three sources and then their roles, they can also be categorized into three uh, sources, uh, roles. So if we look at the sources, we know of uh, animal proteins, uh, uh, we're mostly we are familiar with the red and white meat, uh, farmed and wild caught fish, and then we can also have the that category uh, insects. But also there is a huge movement that is also revolutionizing the food industry as far as the plant proteins, which looks particularly at pulses, uh, legumes and grains. Uh, however, one of the disadvantages of plant proteins is that sometimes they carry what we call anti-nutritional factors, and some of these plant uh, proteins, they do not have the full complement of the essential amino acids or the amino acids. But um, uh, 20 years ago, it would have been impossible to imagine that today we would be talking about a lab-grown meat. So these are also other alternatives that are coming out in the market, so people becoming innovative. So if we look at the role of proteins, we are looking basically at three things, the nutritional, the physiological, the physical or the technological. So I'm going to be focusing mostly on the technological part. So the technological part is what is answering some of the questions that were, have been asked here in terms of texture. What does the proteins do when they are incorporated into the food products? So think about the texture of bread. Think about the form that happens in beer. And this is influenced by the three-dimensional form of the protein and the other two, which is the nutritional and physiological, they are affected mainly by the primary structure of these proteins. So um, just to have a look in terms of edible insects, um, we know that um, the practice of consuming insects, uh, especially in Africa, is not really a, a new idea. Insects have been consumed in Africa um, for decades, uh, if not century, for centuries. If not, yeah. And um, so what we see here is that these insects, in some cases, they've been consumed as delicacies. But over the past few years, we've seen an increase in terms of the research that has gone to in trying to understand these edible insects in terms of their nutritional properties, how we can improve uh, uh, for food security. As Leah has also mentioned that in, in last year, we also had a, a lot of media coverage in terms of the uh, concept store, which uh, I think they did a very fantastic job there. Uh, but also, if you're on social media recently, you would have noted that uh, the Minister of Finance, Mr. Tito Mboweni, has been doing some uh, cooking. And in one of the sessions, uh, he also cooked uh, uh, his meal with uh, Mopani webs, and also that generated a lot of um, interest. So some people, they are really familiar with this practice of consuming um, edible insects, and it is not something that is strange. And also here in our backyard in South Africa, there is also a movement that is uh, moving towards that direction. So. What do we understand about these insects? We know that uh, um, literature tells us that there's almost 2,100 edible insect species. But if we look at the global picture in terms of edible insects, we've got 1 million insects that are available and 0.5% of those are the ones that we can categorize as harmful. In terms of these edible insects, um, beetles um, are, are, are high up there, uh, with more of them falling in that range, but also you've got caterpillars, and you also have termites there, um, uh, which are, includes things like uh, mopani worms, and then the flies will include things like uh, black, soldier, uh, black soldier fly. So is there a case to be made for edible insect consumption in South Africa? And uh, if we look at um, the nutritional composition, we see that in terms of the proteins and in some cases the fat, if we consider, for example, crickets or mealworms, these have protein contents which are comparable to these traditional sources of proteins that we are accustomed to. 
and it, in some cases they have a uh, fiber because of the chitin that is found there. But in terms of farming, because I also mentioned something about available uh, land, so we see that insects can also be farmed and they can also be reared. Uh, uh, we see these days there are concepts like vertical farming. So if you take a look at uh, agri-protein, uh, the operation is most like a food industry, a food processing plant, whereby the strict quality control, the strict hygiene that goes in there, and then the return in terms of the harvesting far exceeds those of plant proteins, uh, of um, uh, plant sources like your rapeseed or even your, your soybean. So there is a case to be made in terms of the production of these um, um, insects, as long as they are able, as Leah mentioned, to convert this organic uh, mass or this organic material into their own mass, and then we can then be able to then derive uh, components such as proteins, um, fat, and in, even in some cases, um, um, essential uh, uh, fatty acids. So, a lot of people, the reason why there is this aversion perhaps towards uh, uh, consuming insects is that we are accustomed to insects being things that are produced in an uncontrolled environment. And for example, if you see the pictures above there, so everything is open to air, and then some people may think that uh, there are safety issues. But now we need to imagine or reimagine the whole system from moving from an agnoentomophagy to, entomo and to entomophagy to rearing or farming of these insects. And we see that in some countries like Thailand, uh, even here in South Africa, there are already people who have started uh, uh, farming black soldier fly for feed and for uh, food consumption. So there is a paradigm shift in terms of um, these processes that are happening. But what I want to draw your attention to is in terms of what could be extracted these from these uh, insects. Lipids could uh, be something that is extracted, as Leah has mentioned, we did work on some um, fatty acid composition um, of black soldier fly trying to extract these, these oils. And then uh, now we are currently looking at the proteins and we can also look at chitin. So if you look at protein, let me take you back to your biochemistry class for those who did biochemistry. So we know that proteins um, basically are macromolecules in line with carbohydrates, lipids, and fats, but the building blocks of proteins are amino acids. And these amino acids determines what happens at the secondary structure, tertiary structure, and the quaternary structure. So the sequence of these amino acids, either in the insects or in other species in general, plays an important role in terms of ensuring what do you get as in terms of uh, 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 essential amino acids? So essential amino acids are those that our bodies require uh, because we cannot synthesize them and then they must be supplied by the diet. So if your diet is lacking in terms of um, um, essential amino acids, you may have uh, protein deficiencies, etc. So we see that these proteins, um, uh, these amino acids play a role also in terms of determining the structure that you're going to have in terms of your final protein. So any journey of trying to understand protein, uh, especially in the insects, uh, what we are currently at this dispensation, will begin with uh, identifying these sources. So um, what are these sources that we want to uh, process? Uh, discovery and selection of these sources um, for example, looking at what we have in South Africa, is it a good idea to go for Mopani worm um, as, a, as, a, as an insect source or is a protein source, or should we look at black soldier fly, mealworms and stuff like that? But then for us to go to the food industry, Leah mentioned a very vital point, which I think needs to be emphasized, is that some people in the context of South Africa um, prefer that these insects are incorporated in food products in an unrecognizable form. So she used the word disguised. So basically you would use them as ingredients, as powders, um, because currently there's three forms in which these insects are consumed. It can either be whole, it can either be paste, or it can either be as part of ingredients. So you would need to have a system where you process them. So if you're talking about proteins, proteins would need to have something like a isolation. What are the techniques that we are using to isolate these proteins? And how do you extract them? 
what forms of drying are you using? And then once you have these proteins, they then have to be characterized, you know, looking at the size in terms of molecular weights, looking at the chemical composition, and then you can then tell and make the structures. So the characterization then informs the, the functionality or the techno-functionality. Perhaps now you're asking yourself, I've, I've been hearing you talking about technofunctionality. What is this technofunctionality that you're talking about? So technofunctionality of an ingredient uh, can be defined as any property of the food, in this case of the protein, except its nutritional value that will affect its utilization. So if you want to utilize this protein, what are these factors that will affect its utilization? And so we talk about things like solubility, um, forming properties, emulsification, gelling, and bioactivity. So I'm going to delve deep into this, but before I get there, so the technofunctionality of these um, insect, edible insect proteins needs to be established. We need to understand what is the solubility properties of these edible insects, because these are the things that are going to inform your product preparation or your product design or your formulation. And also remember that uh, when we talk about foods, food is a complex mixture of chemicals. You know, um, there are other things that are present there. How do these proteins interact? How do they behave when they are used uh, under acidic conditions, R right? So we need to take that into consideration, but the functionality determines how are you going to use your proteins. And then the benefits is that would have products which maybe they are high in nutritional value and uh, in some cases they can uh, taste better and they have good texture and then you can then be able to make um, certain claims. So if I look at um, the first factor which is solubility, uh, when we talk of protein, um, protein technofunctionality or functionality used interchangeably, solubility is very key. So the solubility of proteins uh, depends on the nature of the protein surfaces when they come in contact with the environment. In most cases, we are looking at water. So if uh, I generalize, I can say the protein which has got more hydrophilic surface will be more soluble in water than a protein which is more hydrophobic uh, surface. So this solubility is very important, very key, because it influences other functional properties such as forming and emulsification properties. So if we look at a study that was conducted by Professor Schutla in Germany in 2016 using um, a mealworm as an example, so you start up with a full fat a mealworm powder and then you remove the fat so through a defetting phase and then once you've removed the fat you can then start to um, extract the protein so what we see in terms of solubility as a function of ph we see that at a lower ph the proteins which is the black bars they have a high solubility at pH 2 compared to the samples or to the uh, samples with the uh, full fat. So the pH as it increases, the solubility then begins to drop. So the solubility is at max minimum at a pH around 4. And we know that the, uh, now we have established that the isoelectric point, which is the point of the proteins where the net charge is zero, is around 4.5. So at the isoelectric point, you have the ability, the protein has the ability to form what we call aggregates. As the pH increases, um, the solubility starts to increase again. So what is the mechanism that is involved here? The fact is that uh, the protein, they carry a charge at any given pH except the isoelectric point. So what happens is that this charge um, at higher pH or at the extremes um, results in what we call electrostatic repulsion. So this electrostatic repulsion is what contributes to the stability of your proteins in solution. For example, where you can use proteins as stabilizers in foams or uh, proteins and stabilizers in beverages. So what you want to do here is that if you've got a product that is um, an acidic medium, right? For example, a beverage, so it should be better be soluble at a, a lower pH. And what we see in terms of insects is that other insects such as caterpillars, 
if they studied uh, full fat versus defated flowers, these ones they exhibited um, very poor solubility. And uh, a study that was also conducted looked at the enzymatic hydrolysis. You remember previously I mentioned the processing. So enzymatic hydrolysis basically breaks down these pro, uh, protein components. And we see that this technique improved the solubility of locust by around 55%. So solubility is the first key, very important uh, factor that needs to be considered before we even go further. The second factor is water binding capacity. So this speaks to the hydration or rehydration, which is again another first important step in imparting desirable uh, functional properties in food systems. Um, here we see that uh, samples of, um, in the case of uh, black soldier fly, which is uh, H. lucens and timolite, which is a mealworm, we see that fractions that had a high protein content suddenly had a high fat absorption capacity right so meaning as you remove the the, the fat from the from the from these samples then you bestow upon it high water binding capacity so this water binding capacity then determines the texture and the stability of dry goods and in some cases uh, extruded um, products. So other techniques that can be used to treat edible insects includes what we call cold atmospheric plasma processing. This has also been shown to increase the oil binding capacity now. So remember I said that uh, food, in food systems are very complex and uh, food molecules interact with other things that are present there. So you would want to see how does this protein um, um, behave if I have a sample uh, product that is high in oil properties and uh, how does it behave when it is uh, in a solution that is water is able to bind water. So here in terms of the protein we need to consider the intrinsic factors um, such as for example the amino acid composition is very important and the protein conformation and then also looking at the surface polarity or hydrophobic nature of these uh, proteins. So there is some work that has been done, um, but not all edible insect species have been established. You know, it's what we already have at our disposal, and we are also looking at some work at CPU team. So some of the work that we have done um, last year, which is yet to be published, but we've presented it uh, at a conference, we looked at the forming capacity and the forming stability of black soldier fly and mopani worms. So forms, we know that these are dispersion of gases in a liquid form, right? So in liquids. So because of these proteins, uh, because of their, what we call their amphiphilic nature, so the proteins are able to um, reside in the, in the interfacial area uh, between the air and your gas bubbles. So then they can be able to stabilize these forms. So, uh, by forming capacity is the ability of this protein to give you a form and then by forming stability we mean um how long does it take for that particular form to remain stable so we really saw some interesting things that uh, when we look at the forming capacity of a um for example the black soldier fly versus the, the mopani the mopani if you increase the concentration of the protein it will give you a high form capacity but, and then if you look at the stability, the stability was low compared to the black soldier fly. So why is this happening? So what happens is that because of the molecular weight or because of the molecular structure, um, forms collapse, you know, um, the, the, the gas bubbles. So it's a, uh, it's a concept which is called disproportionation. So the stability then of these forms depends largely uh, on the protein permeability. But what inference we can make is that, for example, in terms of stability, um, as you can see in that picture on the on the far right, um, you see that black soldier fly is very high compared to um, to mopani worm, and we can infer that this can be used as a an alternative to egg, which is currently a, a forming agent. But other studies have also seen that uh, in some insects, the um, foam capacity was around six percent. And in a study that was conducted in Wachningen in 2013, where they looked at house cricket, house cricket uh, did not exhibit any forming properties. So the last one that I want to talk about is um, 
the emulsion capacity and stability. So this is now the ability of these proteins to, um, to, to stabilize or to form um, emulsions. So what do you need in, a, in an emulsion? So an ideal quality of an emulsifier for oil and water emulsions is that it should have a, a balanced amino acid composition and it should have either charged polar and uh, apolar side chains. So this is where we talk about the amphiphatic nature of these proteins. With the exception of um, grasshoppers, we see that the edible insects on the far left of this red line, they are also comparable in terms of these uh, emulsion capacity and stability compared to the counterparts, which are, 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 are plant proteins, right? Things like lupin is very high in, in the emulsion stability. So we still need to do a lot of work in terms of understanding uh, these proteins in terms of how do they behave in terms of these technofunctional properties. So if I can give you some of the example of what is already in literature, um, some people have studied mostly mealworm is one of the close to black soldier fly, between those two are the most studied insects. So we see that uh, some people have used them um, uh, mealworms uh, or silkworms in crickets or crickets in sausages. And uh, I think also Leah worked uh, with sausages uh, previously. And we also see that some crickets can also be, have been used in uh, giving uh, cricket bars. And termites have also been used in buns and, 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 and pastas. And um, some people have already went ahead and, and baked bread using uh, insect uh, flowers, uh, having pastas. And I've seen some pictures online in terms of the Mopane salt. Um, I'm yet to, to, to grab, to have my hands on it, but it's something that is already there in the South African market. And the popcorns, which are kind of having some um, extracts of uh, Mopane, they are also there. So there is a plenty in terms of what can be done with edible insects, but we still need to establish more research because in terms of these technofunctional properties, because it's what is going to inform your application, where are you going to apply and what kind of um, 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 behavior or properties are you trying to achieve? So in conclusion, we, we know or we have established from literature that these edible insect species, they are high in protein content and this can also contribute to uh, food security. In terms of technofunctional properties, we see in some cases it's comparable to plant proteins. However, we need to treat it at a case-by-case basis, studying more edible insects and looking at the technofunctionality and here we also see that there are opportunities for new product developments, uh, for products to be developed and uh, for new markets to be, uh, to be opened. And to reiterate what Leah has said, she also raised vital uh, points that uh, the consumer perceptions, especially in the South African context or even African context, needs to be further be established. And I think we need to be driven by empirical data, you know, um, rather than maybe in some cases relying on emotions, because now once we have data, we can then make inferences. And uh, in terms of legislation in South Africa, I'm not yet aware of any legislation that governs the safety or the production of uh, edible or incorporation of edible insects in food production for hum human consumption. And I think that still needs to be uh, kind of established. Otherwise, I see a, um, a point where innovation is going to be the one that drives uh, legislation in South Africa if regulators are, are slow to, 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 to regulate or to come up with ways there. And uh, in, just in conclusion, I think for me, for future consideration, we also need to consider more industry collaboration with academia and also looking at the small farmers in terms of how they produce these uh, edible insects and uh, before they are incorporated into food systems and uh, looking at quality in terms of the, because again, these edible insect proteins, they um, are influenced as Leah has said by what you feed these insects. So we still need to establish more routine more um, analysis and then the collaboration between these three arms, for me, I think it's what is very important uh, going forward in the South African context. Thank you very much. 
Super, thank you, Lucy, for a fascinating talk um, and really interesting to see the work that you um, have been doing at CPUT on this. Um, we've got a question here around um, uh, food security and will this um, will this really benefit populations um, that are suffering from protein malnutrition or um, will it be too expensive? Um, I think with every innovation there comes the cost but uh, as Leah has said in some cases um, for now in the initial stages of innovations things become really expensive and I think with given with time and uh, if they could be large-scale production um, I do think that there is a possibility that this can alleviate uh, food security. Thank you. Lucy, from my side, um, where will you take your PhD work next in terms of this space? Um, currently, now my work, because we've established uh, some, um, some scientific basis, we, we envision a situation whereby we want to go to, to more product um, development phase. And um, I do think that it's not necessarily a case where we can use one, let's say, insect, but maybe kind of try combinations at first. You know, um, I worked in a project where we, we were looking at the plant proteins or pulses, uh, so where we used combinations of either lupin, faba bean, chickpea to kind of develop these structures that will be uh, desirable. So with my work, I think now we we need to go towards application. So we've established some um, some so, some scientific basis, but now I think the application for, for us is what is going to be very crucial. And we see if you if you consider what you've learned, um, especially around the emulsification um, comparability to plant-based proteins, in your mind, where's the where's the the easiest um, commercial opportunity um, for insect protein? Yeah, for insect protein, I think there's a lot of stuff that can also be done. So maybe looking at beverages and uh, also in some cases, you can also look at bakery products. So you can also um, start there. I'm not sure about uh, uh, other markets, but I think those two can something that we can start looking at. Great. And if you, you mentioned legislation, um, what has happened around the world and what, what do you think, um, you know, what could, the, what could that legislation look like for South Africa? Um, so in Europe, um, the experiences that I've, have, I've had there, so they talk about the EFSA, the European Food Safety Association. So they are really, really also working hard in terms of uh, coming up with legislation. Like in the Netherlands, as uh, Leah has said, that uh, um, they, the larvae or the insects, they need to be fed on a clean feed. Um, so in South Africa, I think we can also learn some 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 things from from there. But I also think that um, we as South African also have to come up with uh, solutions that are going to be beneficial for our context. But at the moment, I would really love to have a situation whereby us as industry, the food industry, the academia, and also government kind of have a conversation. Because from when I started since I think 2016, 17, there hasn't been really any movement or any conversation that has happened with regards to legislation. And I think we also stand a chance to learn from other people what they have done. Uh, EFSA is really putting a lot of regulation with regards to edible insects for human consumption. Thank you. Uh, we have a few more questions. Um, the allergenicity of black soldier fly larva, any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, I, I did anticipate this uh, question. Um, we have not yet studied it, but uh, I think it's something that also needs to be explored in the future. So to look at the allergenicity of black soldier fly, um, I don't have really any data that I can report on with regards to that, but I think it's something that is worth exploring. And uh, this question around pet food um, uh, products using insects, has that um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's uh, quite really challenging um, because now, for example, some people can perceive that is kind of uh, with the negative 
And I think Leah mentioned the point where we need to also look at the branding or the marketing. How do we market these uh, edible insect uh, proteins? So that will also be a very important uh, factor. Already, yes, there is a market that is there for um, 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 insects as a, as a feed. Uh, so whereby people are feeding it to, to pests. I came across a very interesting study um, which suggested that uh, chickens that have been fed with black soldier fly uh, had very good um, egg um, color shape and then in some cases uh, the egg yolk was double on those uh, chickens that were fed uh, black soldier fly. So in some cases you may find that already uh, insects are already in the system for food for human consumption in one way or another, but it's something I think that also needs to be kind of looked at um, in further studies. Thank you. And Busi, have you um, seen research or evaluated the farming process um, and practice um, of farming of insects from a sustainability point of view? Um, um, Dr. Uh, Professor Alexandra Mateis in uh, U, uh, ETH Zurich in Switzerland, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him. So he has done a lot of work in terms of life cycle assessment, but it's very uh, complex uh, uh, calculations and situations. But what they are reporting, that they are reporting that uh, uh, there is some sustainability that can be the sustainability benefits that can be derived from edible insects. And again, with uh, my little knowledge of sustainability, you also have to take into consideration the whole value chain, uh, looking at NAG in and then XAG out. Uh, in the South African context, I think we are still lacking behind. And perhaps one of my appeals is that um, as academics and industry, as we, we begin to engage, I think we also need to move away from, uh, you know, when we think about edible insects now, the only thing that people are doing, they're going to tell you uh, high protein, low fat or minerals and what, but we have not yet really delved deeper in terms of, in terms of the value process as, as a whole, looking at the sustainability, because what goes in into your process and then what comes out there, also, those are things that needs to be factored in to come up with claims that your process is uh, sustainably um, developed. Yes. Um, and one final one around, um, you know, once it gets to a commercial scale, how does one manage the, the raw material specification in terms of meeting a, a specific protein and fat uh, target? Mm. Um, so one of the work uh, part of my PhD was to look at the structural properties of these uh, proteins, uh, particularly black soldier fly, uh, using a technique which is called the uh, FTIR, for a transform infrared spectroscopy. So what spectroscopy does, it tells you um, in terms of the molecular vibrations of your edible insect protein. So basically, we are looking at uh, what are these bands that uh, really emit high um, IR and then what are they? So mostly we see that with proteins, you've got what we call the amide one and then the amide two bands. And so, and then you also have the fingerprint region. So in terms of developing specifications, I think that is one of the tools that can then be used to develop specifications. And it's going to assist us to solve the problem of, um, for example, on the TCT, you know, for example, where people can then put in other things and then claim that uh, these are insect proteins. So the work that I've done has demonstrated that we can use that tool um, in order to identify. So we use what we call soft independent modeling class analogy to basically show that uh, if you've got edible insect proteins, you can put in adulterants. For example, you can mix them with maize, you can mix them with soy. Um, spectroscopy or FTIR is going to show you basically in terms of authenticity. So I think that is a technique that can also be used to create then the specifications um, when this goes into an industrial scale. Super, thank you, VC. We've got a comment here from Karine Davies from Facts on um, the allergenicity question. Um, mm. She says that Facts is also doing some work on it. Um, it's not yet clear, but there does seem to be some cross-reactivity with crustaceans. Thank mm. you, Karine. So okay, there's no more questions. Um, and I just want to, to thank both our speakers for absolutely fascinating um, 
talks and taking us on this journey of edible insects, which I'm sure will be part of our diets in the not too distant future, if not already. Um, and really, really proud to see all the work that's happening in our own country on this um, with CPUT, with Stellenbosch, um, and really encourage the two of you to keep going at that. Um, and it is a, it's just what it's, it would be really wonderful if we could take the academia, government and industry and find a way to collaborate and actually really solve food security issues as well as um, bringing real innovation and novelty to to our to our um, food um, markets. So uh, thank you to you both and and thank you for, to to everyone who attended. Okay, thank you very much.